We are in Champions League, man. That was my Dilly din, dilly dong, come on. Ancara Messi, 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 Hello, welcome to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. My name is Gary Kernin. So this is the first in a new series on the podcast called The Coaching Corner, where we're going to take one aspect of the game and then attempt to cover it in depth and detail for a maximum of 30 minutes. So shorter episode, but the objective is to jump straight in, look at a little bit more detail, take specific subjects within the game and, and go from there. So we're kicking off the first of a Coaching Corner podcast with Louis Lancaster. Louis has coached at Taiwan National Team Assistant Coach. He's also coached in the Chinese Professional League with Shanghai Shenzhen. He's worked at Watford, Portsmouth, Brentford. He holds a UEFA Pro license and he has recently released his first ebook. You can run but you can't hide 50 1v1, 2v2 practices that can be used at all levels. So definitely, definitely check that out. It's on Louis' Twitter page. It's pinned at the top of it. So definitely check out his new ebook. His work is top, top class. So our topic here is elite player development. So development is one of the most common and possibly misunderstood aspects in the game today. With Louis, we're going to talk about former Man City and current Borussia Dortmund player Jadon Sancho who has worked with Louis during his time at Watford. We talk about how you communicate with very good players, how you challenge very good players both technically and mentally. He's got a brilliant story about a player who was more concerned with his Instagram than a specific technique and how he dealt with this. You're going to love that one. And then we zoom out and take a look at development and how it aligns with how we should coach clubs and teams and how do we add pressure and then measure a player's success in terms of the performance of the team. So really, really enjoyed this chat. Cannot wait to hear your thoughts on it. As always, on Twitter, let me know, at Gary Kernin on Instagram, at Gary Kernin. Let me know your thoughts. I've also started a Q&A feature on the Modern Soccer Coach website, modernsoccercoach.com, which will go every Thursday. If you've got any questions, any sides of the game that you want to discuss, chat about, ask, send me an email gary at modernsoccercoach.com so thanks as always for listening thanks as always for the support let me know what you think about this new feature let me know what you think about louis here he is enjoy louis thanks so much for joining me today for the modern soccer coach podcast excited to have you on finally (laughs) finally thank you for having me player development your philosophy is it about moving towards making good players great is it about pushing the top ones through? How do we do that? Just your thoughts, basically. We should be uh, looking to add value to the individual. So, you know, we've all done it as coaches. I was, a, you know, I did it when I was younger. You kind of just deliver a session, but it was like an MOT. Players are just going through the process. But what value am I actually adding? And if you look at it from a business point of view, if you look at a club, the club will give the academy X amount of money. Uh, and after a while, they're going to want to return. They're going to want a player that can actually contribute to the first team or or generate money. So for me, with the statistics being so low on the players that make it through, uh, at some point you're going to have to work with the elite players within the groups. Jaden Sanchez, you've got the the article on him, which we'll we'll share as well. Absolutely brilliant insight to how you work with him. Um, a big big topic over here that is moving up players between age groups and and I caught that halfway into the article and you viewed it as a real positive that he moved up from U14 to U15. How did you see this improving his game? Well it was a good decision all the all the coaches sat down and you know we evaluate will it work will it won't and I just think you need to be flexible really if if it works it works and if it doesn't they just come back. Um but you know everything's quicker um uh, for him <clears throat> Uh, the decisions need to be quicker, the game's quicker, you know, where uh, he might get shoved off the ball, the players are a little bit stronger. But ultimately, his personality wanted to go up, really. He, he was a, a fearless player who loved the challenge and he, he embraced the opportunity and it helped him no end. Yeah, we talk about the importance of speed, technique, tactical understanding in the development process, but 
how important is it for desire how can you tell if a player has it or not and then how can you improve them if they don't have it this is a great question this is something i'm really fascinated with <clears throat> because the, the way technology is going now it, it's incredible you can measure how many shots they had how many passes they had you know the gps systems telling you how many sprints the duration it's incredible but for me i think it's the immeasurable things that are most important such as you know how honest is the player how much desire do they have uh, how trustworthy are they how you know are they fearless how much courage they have um and i, I just think those stats are, are far more important uh, and if a player has it brilliant uh, if they don't have it then within your sessions, you know, you need to kind of offer uh, the player a bit of challenge, but at the same time, a bit of success. I remember um, I, I was fascinated with this measurable business for quite a long time. And then uh, on my pro license, I actually interviewed Troy Deeney. And I believe that. I said, look, every player is talented, and of course, to different degrees. However, I think it's the personality that allows the talent to surface. And he completely agreed because he said, look, throughout his age groups, he was never the best player, but he was the most hungriest. He had the most desire. He wanted to be better than everybody else. And he said, that's what, that's what carried him through. His motivation was so much higher than everybody else's because ultimately if a player needs to improve something, they have to be motivated to improve it. You know, it's all good having this ability, but if, if you don't care, you just don't care. So that's something I'm a big believer in the immeasurables. Building the relationship Again, it's something that we talk about, especially today. It's critical for coaches to get that buy-in. And, you know, we talk about connecting with our players and getting to know them a little bit better. But we're almost conditioned to think about that we have to spend hours and hours doing this with them. And I only thought of that when I read that interview. You spoke to Jaden for 10 seconds at a time. Uh, tell me how and why you did that. Well, for me, it's very clear. If you're working with any player, you must know these three questions. One, who are you working with? Number two, what's their dream? And three, what do you need to add to their game? So if I go back to Jaden, I was working, it was clear to me, I was working with a very driven, uh, exciting, uh, enthusiastic, a player who just needs to be challenged. So I, you need to know their personality and who they are, what make, motivates them and makes them tick. The dream, it was very clear. He said to me straight away, I want to play for one of Europe's top sides and I want to play for England to make my family proud. And then the third bit, which is the key bit, is, well, what can I do or what can we do together to add to your game? And out of everything I've just said, the one word, which is the most important word, is the word add, because it's such a positive word. And we always use that. Everything we said to each other was positive. So it wouldn't be... You know, for example, I'll use you, Gary. I know you're a brilliant winger. It wouldn't be, oh, well done, Gary. You, you beat these two players and you've got this cross in, but because as soon as you throw that word but in, you've lost that player from the conversation. Their body's there, but their mind is elsewhere. They're not listening and it's not positive. So we always use the word add. You know, well done, brilliant. You beat these two players. You've crossed that ball in. And I've noticed something we can add to your game. Now the player wants to listen. And it was all about, right, let's add this. And then we'll add the next thing. And then the 10 second rule come about because I was talking to Jaden and after about 10 seconds, he'll switch off. He'd be, you know, head up in the sky looking at the birds or, you know, he, he wasn't listening. So I thought, well, there's no point talking to him for more than 10 seconds. So I said to myself, I can talk to him for no more than 10 seconds, but I can talk to him as many times as I like. And the experience had to be positive. So I don't know, you play the game, I'd quickly call him over. That flip-flap was unbelievable, that was incredible. You've got to show me, off you go. And then I just kind of kept giving him positivity and then after a month, he was actually coming to me. Now it could be because he, you know, he, he missed a positive vibe, I, I don't know what it was, but that's what I would assume. And I thought, now he's approaching me, now I'm going to up my game and increase it to 20 seconds. So I kind of gave him the sandwich, it'll be positive influence. What can we add? I've noticed this. That might help. And then finish with a positive again. And that's kind of how it all stemmed, really. I didn't want to talk to him if he wasn't really listening. So it's almost like enticing him, drawing him into feedback, selling feedback to him? 
Yeah, I mean, look, every player is different. I can't say this is what you should do with that player and this is what you should do with that player because every player is different. And as I said, you need to identify who you're working with, what's their dream and what do you need to add. And that that kind of formula worked for Jaden. It might not work for someone else, but for him, that's, that's what he needed. It, it worked for him, it worked for me, and hopefully uh, it added to his game. In that awareness piece, was there a consistent time, place, meet and follow up or was it just adapted did you just play it by ear every week and just see how it was going well he was so competitive I mean uh, it doesn't matter if he's walking out on a, a local council park or he's walking out in front of Wembley every it, it doesn't matter he just wants to have fun he just wants to play football it doesn't matter how many people are watching him he doesn't care he's just fearless now I know because he loves the game so much and he wants to play he cannot miss a minute of football so if the game's going on and you're talking to him, that, that won't work. And ultimately, the game actually doesn't stop in real life. So how can I stop him playing that game? So he was more of a water, uh, like during the water break. You know, everyone's cooling down. They're getting their two minutes. They're getting their breather back. That would be the time to, to talk to him. But an, a lot of the time as well, because he was at the Watford School and we were based there, it could just be down a corridor. And I call that kind of ghost coaching. You know, so you're not actually on the pitch. It's not all structured. You're not meant to talk to the players in this way, that way. It could just be down the corridor. How's that trick coming on? Have you added it to your game yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah I've added it. Brilliant. So it's like there's times you can talk to them away from the training ground as well. Yeah, that's where the personality of the coach becomes important, right? Because if you're this strict authoritarian guy, then players are probably going to walk the other way when they see you coming around the corridor. Maybe some some players like it, some players don't. Uh, but I think the key word you said there is the connection. You've got to connect with the individual. If you can't connect with the individual, then there's no point. Everything else will fail. You could be the best coach in the world, best ideas, best execution. If you can't connect, it's a problem. Let's talk about making good players great. Uh, again, just not trying to improve every player in the world, but producing the elite player. And then positionally, how would you pr- approach doing extra work with the top players or how would you go about challenging the very best players technically in, in a team or in an age group? Again, it comes down to that connection. You've got to be able to sit down with the player and ask them what they, what they want because you could be working with this player for, I don't know, two or three week period trying to add to his game and it, it's not working. So I think you've got to sit down with them and um, a prime example was working in China at Shanghai Shenzhen and we had a Oh, a beautiful player, Brazilian. He was amazing, Biro Biro. And I remember we were doing um, some finishing after training. He was there about half hour, serving balls, were inside the box, outside the box, variety of shots. And in that half hour, he must have had a hundred shots. I remember. I remember the moment clearly. He had a hundred shots. Some went in the top corner, and some went over in the car park. And I thought, well, you know, he's a really good player, but I could probably do that. Because if I'm going to have 100 shots, I would like to think that one of them, Gary, one of them would go in that top corner. And I thought to myself, well, this isn't the game because at the weekend he had a real clear chance and he didn't go in. So I said to him, look, this is what we're going to do from now on, if you're happy to do it. You're going to get three training sessions extras a week. The first session will be multiple shots. You can have whatever shots you want and, you know, 100 shots. The world is your oyster. Then the second session, this is what we'll do. You'll only get the amount of shots that you had in the previous game. So if you had three shots in that game, you'll get three shots now. And then the day before the game, we just limit it to one shot. One moment, one opportunity. And it and it seemed to work for him because what you're doing is you're piling on the pressure. And it's you know, you're getting the environment as close to the game as possible because now he's under pressure. You have a better chance then of connect and practice the game as well, perhaps? Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, you know, as we said about the connection, I kind of, some things are, are unplanned. You know, you can plan for this, plan for that, but sometimes the best plans are unplanned. And I remember once I, I left my phone in my pocket. I, I don't know why. Um, and I remember working on these free kicks with him, this player, Biro Biro. And I thought, right, what I'll do, I'll get this connection going. You know, we'll get a little bit of rapport. I'll get my phone out and I'll feel him taking this free kick. So the understanding for me was after the free kick, we could start talking about hips, toes, chest. And and he didn't really care about that. What he did, as soon as the phone came out, he put the ball in the top corner. And his sole motivation was, 
I want that video of you because I want it for my Instagram. <laughs> that was the sole purpose of that video for him when I wanted the other spin. And suddenly the keeper's swap, the next keeper's in. The keeper is so motivated because the keeper wants the video for his Instagram. Now suddenly the Brazilian Biro Biro, he wants to score the free kick because he wants it for his Instagram. Suddenly the challenge and the competition went right up. So again, it, it was unplanned, but it worked. And it might not work for everyone, but it, it certainly worked for us. Because now it's you're getting the environment as close to the game as possible. And that's almost back to your first point about Jaden, right? It's getting to the player's level. What do they really want? And if they want it for their social media and it drives a bit of competition or energy, then you've got to go to that level rather than trying to sell them on the hips or the technical points? For me, it doesn't matter what motivates a player. As long as they are motivated, surely. Mm. But that would be, that goes the whole way up, right? That goes money as well. Like if you're dealing with a professional player, it's fine if they're motivated by money, as long as they want to work and they want to produce and they want to get better. Yeah, of course. As, as long as they're motiv- motivated, it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. You know, uh, and you know, and, and sometimes what what you'll lose in something, you might gain in something else, or or vice versa. You know, for in China, for instance, you know, working out there, food is a big part of their culture. You know, and the sports scientists might say, well, I don't think they should be eating this. I don't think they should be eating that. Well, if you take that away, you may gain I don't know five percent of nutrition, but you could lose eighty percent of desire and hunger and and camaraderie and teamwork and you know, all the other things. So it's a constant game of what you're losing, what you're gaining. And, and that's where I think Gary White, the manager, who, who I worked alongside for the last three years, he was very clever at that, very astute, always calculating what you'll lose and what you'll gain. Your presentation with Inspire, Coach Ed, the me and team, you detail a system about measuring a player's output or having an impact on a game that, that maybe isn't just through goals or assists. Can you talk a little bit about how you did this? Yeah, it was. Uh, I was at Watford Football Club, and uh, they changed my role, and it was such an enjoyable role. I really got to grips with it. It was, it was a fascinating role, and it was to become an individual developer. So I said to the academy manager, "Look, you know, <clears throat> we've got all these players with the statistics being so low. You know, wh- why are we going to work with everybody? Because everyone's got a head coach, everyone's got an assistant coach. Um, you know, if I'm there to work with the individuals, I'll just w- work with the best players." And then I was thinking, well, if the game, if the, you know, if a team win at the weekend, it's kind of glossed over that everyone's had a good game. Whereas if a team lose, you know, it's kind of well, everyone's had a bad game. Well, actually, someone may have to produce the performance of their life. Or if you win a game and your star player uh, hasn't produced, you know, he might produce nine out of ten every week. But if he's dropped to a seven, he still may be your best player. However, his individual his individual performance wasn't good enough. So I kind of got to thinking, well, when you're working with individuals, they don't need to judge themselves on the group because that's what a lot of players do. They see themselves as the best player in the group. Therefore, they're going to make it. So I kind of thought, well, they don't need to judge themselves on the group. They need to judge themselves on the demands and what's required at the highest level. And then what I did, I kind of got a little bit fascinated with this me and team. And then I started working on... A point system and basically to cut a long story short players can earn points for where they receive and release the ball on the pitch and then every individual has points at the end of the game all the individual points add up and then it will have like my team will have a total points against your team Gary and what happened was the team with the most points in 50 games of football across all the top five European leagues the top leagues international football all the way down to the conference team with the most points never lost the thing i love about that is that again we love the metrics and and it's added an extra dimension to coaching but it's hard to put a metric on a attacking midfielder that's helping out and connecting the passes uh, and too often yeah we we do get carried away don't we by well we won and they got on the ball a fair bit so they they, they had a decent game and we just generalize Yes, it did. I mean, what personally, I'm done with the study now. I got everything I needed from it, and uh, you know, I, I'm I'm not trying to make art into a science, so I don't fully go with it. But it was amazing for me. So even in China, you know, I was watching games, and I would just notice these points, and I'd go to the gaffer and say, right, 
this player can hurt us, that player can hurt us, and he can hurt us. All the others don't pass forwards. So it helped me analyse oppositions. Um, within development, it helped me. Um, you know, I had some great conversations at Watford with a few players. We're saying, look, you know, you need to get more points. And then you start throwing in the questions. Well, who, what, when, where and why? How can you get more points? And the players are so intelligent. They know all the answers. They'll say, well, I could do this before I receive the ball, check my shoulder. If I touch it, I can eliminate the player off my first touch. And then what started to happen was the players kind of felt, well, this is what I'm doing individually for myself. But now I need other players. I need other players to help me. And this is where you've got to be clever, I think, with individual development for your best players on setting targets. So every player in the academy will get a target. They'll have a weekly target, a six-week target, and then a season-long target. So uh, <clears throat> for me, that baffles me. I think it's too much. Uh, so what we kind of did, <clears throat> well, what I tried to do was give the best players a target that will help them. So Gary Kinnean was my number 10, fantastic player. You need to find an influence in the game. So you need to score, create more goals. So that's your target. And we'll work with you how to do that, you know. And then all the other players, will well, not all of them, but we'll give some players targets which will help you. So if you're a number 10, you need more ball. So right, we'll say to the fullbacks, right, can you find the number 10? That's your target. So hopefully they're going to start looking up and playing forward which now gives you more ball, therefore more trial and error learning, therefore more probability. And it could be, you know, you need more options ahead of the ball. So you could say to the right winger, right, OK, when, when everyone gets the ball, show feet, or, but when Gary Kaneen gets it, you've got to make that running behind. Mm -hmm. So it just starts to add, and that actually comes from um, Diego Costa at Chelsea. So I remember watching Diego Costa. Every player that got the ball in the Chelsea team would pin the defender. But every time Fabregas got it, he'd always make that running behind. Do you think that's where increased you know, competitiveness with players? We always said growing up that that was such a big attribute, but now it's almost competitiveness mixed with intelligence. Just knowing, like, figuring stuff out, problem solving constantly, how to make an impact. Uh, I'm a firm believer in the brain trumps everything, for sure. The brain definitely trumps everything because say you've got this number 10 you need to surround him with the most intelligent players you know he needs to play on a team that have more possession in training it's not just a case of having training and say we'll play 9v9 and split the teams up and off you go I used to invest huge amounts of time getting the right matchups so if you've got your number 10 he needs to be in the team that have more ball if you want to develop the centre back put him on the team with less ball depending on the outcomes of what you want to get from him I remember having some really good conversations and one guy that really changed my mindset was Alberto Copelles. I interviewed him for my pro licence because my study was, what is a maverick and how do you get the best out of them? So I got his number uh, and was talking about Messi and I kind of said, well, how on earth did you produce him? And he said to me, well, well, he kind of produced himself, <laughs> but he also had to be surrounded by the most intelligent players. And he said, not the best players because you have to identify how a player has an influence on the game some players can influence the game through speed and power but we didn't want that we wanted intelligent players and he said that's why now when he plays for Barcelona he's surrounded by a high level of intelligence and he produces but actually when he plays for Argentina the level of intelligence reduces so it's a really interesting uh, spin on it and then then we was talking about England he said look England have got amazing players you know, they've had Gerard Beckham, Rear Ferdinand, Michael Owen, Skulls. There's hundreds of them. And he said when they play for their clubs, the level of intelligence is really high. But when these English players get together, does it reduce? I thought it was a fair point. That makes you think, doesn't it? Yeah, well, I was quite interested by this. So I remember being at Watford and I got, in my opinion, at that time, I had the 12s to 16s and I chose the five most intelligent 12, 13s, 14s. The five most intelligent. Forget physicality, chuck that out the window. Forget technique, put that out the window. Just the brains. So I literally did a, a little square, one on each side, one in the middle, so there's five players. And then I got the two, uh, two under-16s players that have an influence in a game through speed and power. And it was a simple rondo, 5v2, keep the ball. No tackling. And the two 16s couldn't get the ball. Couldn't get the ball off them. And obviously, it will break down, of course. So when it did break down, the two 16s go on the outside and 
and the other two go in the middle. Every time it broke down after that, it was always through the 16s. <laughs> and that just it just changed my mindset on how we assess players and, and it confirmed my belief that the brain trumps everything. What lessons did you learn about elite player development from your time in China? China was very interesting. Thankfully, I got to look, uh, watch a lot of sessions and I would say technically the players are incredible. Uh, acceleration over short distances, desire that they'll do anything for the team. They're, they're amazing. They're amazing in that respect. I just think that the one thing they need to do is, is play forward more. Because uh, the sessions I watch, there's, uh, they do a lot of passing patterns, which is fine. Passing patterns are great, but you need to work out the outcome of why you're doing that passing pattern. Um, and I think that was missing for them. And then a lot of their possession games were non-directional. So they would play 5v2s, 6v4s, whatever the numbers were. But there was nowhere to go. There was no target. There was no area. There was no goal. And I remember Gary White and I immediately, we said, look, we, everything we do has to have a goal. It has to be a target. There has to be some outcome. And then, and you know, it's like, Gary, you put a goal in a session. What happens to the players? <laughs> they start yeah. to perk up. They're more motivated. You know, that there's more enthusiasm. It's competitive. So that was a real spin on the on the twist, really. Did you create an environment that was then more enjoyable for them to come to training in? Did you find that? Yeah, I'd like to think so. You'll never know the true true answer, but I'd okay. like to think we did. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're coaching four-year-olds or, or senior professionals. I think when anyone gets in that car, they need to want to come back to the next session. And, uh, you know, I coach because I love it. And the day I, I stop loving it, I'll stop coaching. And I think players love football so the day they stop enjoying their football they'll get less they'll, they'll be less motivated so you've got to give it's got to be fun I, I believe you know Gary and I sat down we invest huge amounts of time and it was always right let's go for these three things the session must be realistic it has to be educational and it has to be challenging the best players want to be challenged so every session, we, you know, I'd put something together, he'd, he'd challenge it, I'd challenge him, and that's where I've got a lot of respect for Gary. He was really open. Last one for you. What piece of advice would you have for coaches who want to produce those creative individual difference makers rather than simply build good teams? Someone that's really into that individual development piece? Interesting question. Personally, I'm drawn to these type of players that can produce moments of brilliance when it comes to the crunch. Uh, I think stick to the stick to the formula for me. Identify who you're working with, what's their dream, what can you do to add to their game, and you just need to be a little bit patient with them. They're going to try things that don't work, but you just have to let let it go. And you know, also ask the question of why they did something. You know, me and you, Gary, are two fantastic number tens, aren't we? So what will happen is we might make the same mistake, exactly the same on the pitch. However, that mistake could be completely different. So, for instance, you'll only know if it's different if you ask the question. So you and I know that the space is, I know, ahead of you. Now, as a coach, if I come in and I say to you, Gary, where's the space? If you say it's ahead of me, then I'll tick that box. And I now know it's not a decision-making problem. It could be a technical problem or it could be, uh, I know, a confidence problem that you didn't want to play that pass. Whereas the coach might come to me now with a space we know is ahead of me. And he might say, Louis, where's the space? And I say, it's over there. It's a complete... And now he knows, well, actually, this is a decision-making problem. But to the, the eye on the side of the pitch, that could be diagnosed as the same problem. So I think you have to ask these players questions. Who, what, when, where and why? And if they want the ball and you want them to enjoy the ball, put them in a team that's going to dominate the ball in training. They'll have more, more trial and error learning, more probability, you know, they'll, and they'll get a lot of challenge and a lot of success. Louis Top Class, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Gary, thank you. Thanks so much to Louis for his time and his insight there. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Where to start, where to start. Um, absolutely brilliant, brilliant insight into his mind and player development and experiences, everything. Tough, tough to start to review that there. There's so much there. I think for me, how he began with when he was talking about the players moving up an age group, he said, you've got to be flexible. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. 
and I think that's such a simple approach but it's so rare like very very few people are flexible with their thinking are creative with their thinking and then how intentional Louis is on top of that there with language using ad over but the timing quality over quantity the 10 second rule his session design the extra shooting practice with Biro Biro ghost coaching meeting players in the corridor and then again the simplicity I didn't want to talk to him if he wasn't really listening up in my game to 20 seconds the game doesn't stop in real life so don't pull the player out and I just wrote so many notes during that there and I found that I was I was almost rewriting the whole podcast again so there's so much there and for me the big takeaway for coaches that I would advise them to look at is the fact that Louis has so many qualities as a coach you know he's obviously an unbelievable coach passion intelligence he's open to ideas he's humble but so important, I think, is creativity, his ability to think outside the box, his ability to think for the next step, how to evolve his coaching. If something was working, he was looking it up in his game. He's always personalising his coaching in terms of putting his own spin on his personality. And, and I think that's a really, really important lesson for coaches to learn that, yeah, we can learn from others and we can look at books and we can see how people work, but that doesn't mean we necessarily have to copy them because if you are more more authentic it just creates more confidence in what you're doing you're more passionate about it and players feel that energy players are drawn towards that so no surprise that Louis has impacted the players that he has and worked at the level that he has because he has personalized his coaching to a really really high level so um, yeah let me know your thoughts always always interested to hear what people enjoyed what people have questions about what resonated with different coaches so please let me know at Gary Kernin on Twitter at Gary Kernin on Instagram don't forget check out Louis' new book uh, that's on his Twitter page as well so definitely worth checking out and thank you so much for listening thanks for supporting the podcast have a great week thank you for listening to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast for more coaching topics, sessions, and resources, head on over to Coach Kernine on Facebook or visit the website at www.modernsoccercoach.com.